Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very, very special edition of Holly Randall Unfiltered. I am so excited to have a true legend in my midst. I am talking about the incredible Jim South. If you don't know who Jim South is, you don't know your porn history, so shame on you. He was the original porn agent back in the day when there really was pretty much only one game in town, and that was this gentleman over here. So Jim, thank you so much for coming on and coming to speak to me. My pleasure. Uh, Jim is somebody who is responsible for launching the careers of so many different people in the industry. Um, You represented girls such as uh, Christy Canyon, Shauna Grant, um, Jenna Jameson, um, Tracy Lords, whose story we will definitely get to later. You name it, they were part of your agency. So let's start from the beginning. Can you tell me about how you got into the agency business? Because I believe that you began doing mainstream modeling, right? Right. Uh, I was with an agency and a school uh, that would get people work, uh, but they would also put them into training. And uh, I went with that for a while, and then I thought it would really be great if I could get into something where the the person coming in didn't have to pay anything. Mm -hmm. They weren't charged anything, and it was just making money. And that's when I opened World Modeling. And so at the beginning, you were just doing like nude shoots or figure modeling, as they called it back then, right? That's correct. I was just uh, uh, doing the nudity, no sex. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, back then, and you got to remember, this was 40 years ago, that um, the number of girls that I used to have, I an average week for me was 20 to 35 girls. Is I this was in new girls? All newspapers. Wow. I mean, uh, I was Long Beach, Santa Monica Evening Outlet, Daily News. I could go on about the number of papers that I ran. And uh, it it was it was very good, but if you told me in your shoot at the end of it the girl had to use some toy on herself, I'd tell you to get out of my office. Wow! Just nudity. That was, nudity only. So yeah. like penthouse and probably hustler at the time club, high society, Cherie. Club was great. Club was great. Yeah, boy, that when that guy found out that I was no longer dealing with Flint for a couple of years. He was paying me an extra grand a month. Wow. The owner of Club. Yeah. Those were the days. I can't remember his name. Do you Uh, know what it is? No, I just know that we dealt with Lisa Massaro all the time. Mm -hmm. She was kind of the woman who was in charge of everything. But Club was one of the top magazines, and they paid like the top rate of – Everybody else, besides Hustler. Hustler also paid really well, but they had a lot of really strict rules because back then you could sell second rights to foreign magazines. And back then, a lot of girls did not want to be in Hustler. Yeah. Some of them, a couple even over the jokes. Yeah. And I even turned them down when it was something to do with religion and politics, and I wouldn't get them who they wanted. And I, I can't remember the name. And there was a, f- I mean, there was a time period, you know, because Larry went through many stages. Right. And there was that time period where he kind of became quite manic, and then he became a born-again Christian, and then he waved back from that. So there was a time that Hustler Magazine was full of religious, like highly offensive religious jokes. Um, I mean, lots of really, really inflammatory Oh yeah, you know articles. He was known for that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was yeah. his thing, and and that was what made him one of the great champions of free speech. Mm-hmm. Um, so you must have really struggled with that because there was a time period that Hustler was pretty out there. There was a time where if a girl from a one to a ten was a seven mm-hmm. on the Richter scale, usable but not a superstar. I could book that girl just for magazines, Mm. 15, 20, 25 jobs. Wow. And a lot of people would reshoot. Yes. And then the gentleman, and I will use his name as Sam, Mm -hmm. came into my office. Now, back then, 
you're going to laugh. Way, and again, this is 40 years ago. Back then, it was, uh, my fee was $20, okay? The girl's <laughs> fee was 50 right. See, I knew you'd laugh. <laughs> and uh, this Sam came into my office, uh, wanted to deal with me. I think he had a line. I think it was called Golden Girls, but I'm not positive. Mm-hmm. And so uh, he made me an offer of giving me 50 a girl instead of 20. Right. And I said, no, I'm not interested in booking porn. Right. A few months later, about a month later, he came back. He offered me 100, Mm -hmm. which is five times what my rate was. Which is standard nowadays, by the way. Yeah. And so anyway, he, uh, he had that. When he did to make a long story short, when he got to two hundred, all of us are greedy to a point, including me. <laughs> so I took it, and that that was my first pimping and pandering case. Oh my god! They end up busting him about six months into it. Right? How many times were you arrested for pimping and pandering? I believe it was three. And you actually, like, went to jail and spent the night in jail? Or they just took you down to the station? When they raided Reb. Now, Reb was your rival agent. Yeah. And they came after me. I went to the Van Nuys jail. And (laughs) another funny story. Uh, Anyway, I went to the Van Nuys jail. And Jim Como, the cop that was administrative advice that had busted me before Mm -hmm. that I knew. Very pleasant guy, very nice. In fact, I even warned your mom once mm. when I heard they were going through her trash. Yeah, that's what she told me, that's that right. they would go through her trash and that you couldn't release the location of where you were shooting at until like the morning of and everybody had to follow each other there. She said and it was we used much more exciting girls, back then. We used to teach girls how to figure out if they're being followed. And mm-hmm. how do you do that? Very simple. You have them get off the freeway, go into a residential area. Okay, pull in a driveway, back out, come back this way. If they're following you, they're going to pass you. Mm. Very simple. Mm. And this was pretty frequent. Oh, yeah. They had, well, they would scare a girl and say, your mom's going to know. It's going to be in the newspapers that you're doing X-rated films, and it's this and it's that. And it was it was tough back then. Yeah. Really was tough. If they busted me enough, they would break my back financially. Right. I would be out of business. And they said, being idiots, it would be the end of the industry, that nobody can make the end of the industry. There's no stopping porn. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think laughed. history has proved that. I actually laughed when it. That's ridiculous. Yeah, no, it is. So was it very, str- that must have been incredibly stressful for you. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. A lot. You went through, back then, you went through a lot. Yeah. I mean, people think, you know, shooting porn is difficult nowadays. Back then, it was Whew. it was very tricky. It was tough. Plus, no matter how much I bitched and complained, you couldn't get a girl to stop doing drugs. <laughs> you just... You just couldn't. So before we go to that, I just want to let the audience know, because a lot of people who are watching this don't really know like the history of porn. So the whole pimping and pandering, all those suits, all of um, all of the Vice Squad stuff, that all ended when the Freeman case came about. And um, the I can't remember the first name of the guy, but it was something Freeman. Hal. Hal Freeman. Okay. And they won. And that is actually what made California... Um, one of the only states in the United States where porn is technically legal to shoot here only because it went to court and it was determined in a court of law that it was legal to shoot porn. It was not pimping and pandering. And one of the justices said that it looked, this is a quote, that it looked as if the uh, Los Angeles and the state of California was trying to make, quote, an end run around the First Amendment, Mm. that this law was not made for the person shooting the movie. Right. That was made for the pimp that beats the girl, that takes her money. Right. You know, that 
routine. Yeah. I mean, people often ask me, what's the difference between prostitution and porn? And I like to point out like a very distinct difference, which is when you're producing porn, a third party producer is hiring two professional performers to engage in a sex act together, which is then distributed for the entertainment of the masses. So you're actually creating a product, an entertainment product. Mm -hmm. Prostitution is when you are on a personal individual basis being paid by somebody to directly to have sex with them. So there's a large difference between the two. Whether or not you think there's a moral difference between the two doesn't matter. But in terms of the law, that is the distinct difference between the two. So um, so the Freeman case came about and porn was legal in California. Mm-hmm. So you must have breathed a real sigh of relief when that happened. Yeah, I did. Were you yeah. guys surprised by that outcome? Oh, yeah. I mean, Just like I, I'm told they're going to reverse this thing about the independent contractor yeah. and paying Maybe taxes. Five. That's why I stopped financing movies. Yeah. If they got into that where you had to report the money, I have to match what was taken out of the girl's check. Oh, I know. It's a pain in the butt, and you don't want to mess with internal revenue. No, I know. They'll spend fifteen grand to collect two. Well, actually, so in this case, it's the EDD, the Employment Development Department, that comes after. No. So, and they are a beast themselves as well. I've yeah. had issues with them before. So, Jesus. it's it's all a bit of a nightmare. Um, so, so the Freeman case passes. Mm-hmm. Porn is technically legal. Um, but, you know, things are not easy for you. After well, it, it, the, the production did explode. Mm-hmm. I mean, back then, there were probably 15 guys that worked constantly. Yeah. And the girls love working with them, and they show the girl the respect, and they're on time, and they don't try to pull any crap. Can you name any names of those kinds of guys? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Randy West. Mm-hmm. You remember him? I do remember him. Actually, I have a funny Randy West story. So the first time I went to AVN with my mom, like back in, I don't know, 2000 or something like that, my mom introduced me to him and he goes, I remember you. Your mom was shooting me for Playgirl, like out in her backyard. And you came running out. You got away from your nanny and you came oh. running out in diapers. <laughs> And I was naked in the backyard being shot by your mom and this little girl comes running up and uh, oh that was God. the first time we met. And I was like, I don't remember that, but. <laughs> Mike, Mike Stapp was another guy. Uh, there, there were. Actually, I want to ask you because back then. Mark Goldberg. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do it. He's come to me. Now, back then there was no Viagra. Correct. So you, and there was no Caverjack. Do you know what Caverjack is? No. It's when guys inject their penis with this thing that keeps it hard. And do you know that men, I just learned this the other day. Do you know that performers are now getting pumps put into their penis so they can actually press a button in their testicles and make their dick get hard? We got robotic penises, Jim. It's crazy. How can they do that? I I think because they take so many, so much Viagra and so much Caverjack that it fucks with their dick. And so then they have to get an implant in order to make it work again. Yeah, because there was a guy, Rambo, Rambone. It was <laughs> had a course. huge, huge dick, the biggest one I've ever seen. And he started injecting himself. Yeah, so that would. And about Jack. two years later, it looked like a blob. <laughs> Literally, I can't understand. <laughs> I can't, I'm too old for this. I really am. We all are, Jim. Oh we all are. God. So, pumps? yeah, oh. yeah, penis pumps. Apparently, Larry Flint has one too, but that makes sense because Larry Flint is he's, a pump. He's in a wheelchair. We will get to your Larry Flint story. There's so many stories. I just have to like section them out because there's just like so much to cover. Oh, you weren't in the office, huh? No, no, no. There, there are a lot of people there. He likes the likes the audience. So, um, yeah, so what was it like back then with guys with no Viagra? I mean. Uh, every excuse in the world. Yeah. The room was not the right color. <laughs> I re- no, I remember that as an excuse. Somebody really said that? Oh, yeah. 
huh. a guy's not going to admit he can't get it up with the girl. Right. He's going to think you think that he's gay. <laughs> and he's not. He's just nervous. Of course. I think people don't really give, you know, good male porn stars the credit that they're due because uh-huh. it's an incredibly difficult thing to get your penis hard in front of a room full of people on command, keep it hard for a long time, take breaks, and then come on command. I mean, there's few people who can do that. That's tough. That, that's a tough one. Um, I also want to ask you about, uh, so you had these famous Polaroid books. Mm-hmm. So this was back before the internet, people. I know, I know it's crazy that there was a time that existed before the internet, but it's true. So what Jim used to do is take Polaroids of all the new girls that would come in and he would put them in these books. And so he had all these books filled with Polaroids of girls and you would have to come to his office and go through these Polaroid books to find any new talent that you wanted to hire. So your office was really like a hub of the porn industry. I mean, everybody came through there. Yeah, they did for a while. That's for sure. Did it become kind of like a social hangout? It became where too many people were hanging out in the office. We were having trouble getting the right information on a new girl and keeping her away from girls that had been in, mm-hmm. that they're not getting work right now mm-hmm. or something. So it, it's it's a little bit of a hang-up. In, in other words, if I pitched you on the phone, right. I would not get into X-rated movies. Mm-hmm. I would let you know there was nudity right. involved, right. but not X-rated. Then when they come in and they see you're actually in an office, um, then they just... They make out to it, and we don't want the girls complaining to the brand new girls who may maybe only wants to do club. Right. See, because that would run them off. That would right. scare them. Right. Once the pictures are shot and they're over the worst part of it, mm-hmm. or what they feel right. is the worst part, once it's shot, uh, then she's more apt to do movies. Right. Because she went back with a guy. The guy didn't make a pass, took the picture, and came out. And one girl even said, well, what do you think? You didn't tell me what you thought. I don't like to talk to them. This is going to sound weird when they're nude. Mm. Too many stories can come back. Right. I once told a girl, you're very attractive. I think you'll do very well at this. That was my exact words. That's not what she told her boyfriend that I said. Oh, really? Yeah, and it was one of those. Oh. Yeah, did you ever get, like, threatened by angry boyfriends? A couple of times. A couple of times. Yeah. How'd you handle that? Gently. (laughs) Uh, Most of, I got along, I got along pretty much with everybody. Right. I mean, as long as they didn't. Get me into an office with 30 employees there. Right, right. Well, I mean, you've always been somebody who's had a reputation for being really respectful, very professional. You were never somebody who was in it to try to sleep with the girls. No. And that is the case. There's a lot of agents that that is the case. That's, you know? that's what's hardest to overcome. Right. Is coming it really that is. That stereotype. Yeah, that type. Because most guys, and I understand it, are interested in taking the girl to bed. Right. You know, but me, I want the girl to make a lot of money and me to make a little money. Right. And that's the way that it works. And that's that's the right way to look at it. Now, was there ever a girl that came in who, you know, maybe just wanted some quick money, but you could sense that it was just the wrong path for her? Like, did you ever talk anybody out of the adult industry? Bill Margo was known for that. Mm. He would try to talk them out of it. And in some cases, he succeeded. But a lot of them would come back later Mm -hmm. and try it again, Mm -hmm. too. Yeah, there have been a few times, not often, but a few times that I try to talk girls out of it Mm. or said, you can't take it back once you do it. Yeah. Well, especially now with the Internet. Oh, my. Like, you really can't take it back. And the problem is, too, is that a lot of times these girls who did movies back then and, you know, their stuff was only distributed 
on DVD or actually, sorry, I should say like VHS Mm -hmm. in magazines, you know, tangible products that would eventually eventually kind of disappear, get buried in someone's closet. Um, A lot of this stuff was revived and then put on the internet for everyone to see. So these girls who thought they were just doing this small little gig that nobody would see, it's come out and it can come back and bite them later in the ass because nobody anticipated the internet. You took all the Polaroids yourselves, right? Most for most, no, no, for most not time. all. A uh, lot of them, though. If a girl was kind of borderline, mm. or if it was a guy, in most cases, I would get somebody else to shoot. Somebody that worked for me, right? So, what did you? Because I know that you did have to photo take Polaroids of a guy every once in a while, right. and I think you and I had a similar method because I used to have to do the same thing. So, can you tell us about how you? How you handled that because it's difficult for a guy because a guy's got to get hard, right? He's got to get he's got to get hard, looks like. and he's going to do it faster with a girl taking right. the picture than a guy, right? Well, maybe not always, <laughs> but in most cases, and uh, yeah. So you would take him to the back room. I would hand him a magazine. Mm-hmm. I said, "When you're ready, crack the door and holler." Mm-hmm. That's when the guy came out and said, "I think I made a mistake or whatever it was." <laughs> That was one particular guy. Yeah. And he'd uh, accidentally gotten himself hard to completion, correct? Correct. And you made him clean up after himself? Yep. It was on the carpet? Yep. Oh, that's not easy to yep. get out. I- <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I used to have to do the same thing. So they always made me, my mom always made me take the pictures. And it was my least favorite thing to do because it's so <laughs> awkward to ask a guy to get hard by himself, right? And so I would do the same thing. I'd put him in the back room. I'd give him some magazines. And right. I'd be like, let me know when you're ready. And I would perch just outside the door because I wanted to get in there as quickly as possible before it went right. down. Right. So I'd be outside the door waiting and I could just hear in there that... <laughs> through the door. That's a funny noise. It's, 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 you know, it's something I've heard a lot in my day. <laughs> and, um, and then finally, like a knock or I'm ready. And then I like run in there and I'm like taking pictures before his penis goes down. And, um, and then I'm like, thank you very much and send him on his way. Your mom sure gave me a lot of business. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then I'm going to ask you actually what it was like to work with my mom, because I know that you knew her very, very well. I respected her. Didn't always love her, but I did respect her. No, I did respect her. Yeah. And what I like the most Mm. is she takes no shit from anybody. This is true. Well, that's... Uh, listen, as a woman in this business, mm-hmm. you've got to be a little bit that way. Yeah. If you're not, they'll run over you. This is true. All right. We'll be right back. Um, hang tight. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Okay, so we're back. So Jim, you worked a lot with my mother, Suze Randall, and she was one of the only, if not the only, like, erotic photographer working back then. Is that right? 
Pretty pretty much. Yeah. I mean, there may be here or there somebody would slip in or somebody would be an independent, but yeah, pretty much. And uh, can you remember the first time you met her? No, I really don't. But like I said, my office used to be almost like the bus station. <laughs> it really was. And what was she like to work with? Uh, very demanding. Mm. But I got the impression she wouldn't she wouldn't ask you to do anything that you were intensely against doing. Right. She wouldn't do that. She paid well mm-hmm. for it. Uh, never had to worry about her bouncing a check. Right. And boy, is that another story. <laughs> Not with her, but right, right, right. with other people. I, I can imagine. And uh, basically, that's about it. Like I said, she was... She was smart mm. and still is mm-hmm. and uh, would be uh, – she even got along with Flint for a while. Yeah. She still she still loves and admires Flint. Um, they've definitely had their share of run-ins for sure. I don't think there's anybody in the world that Larry Flint or my mom, to be fair, hasn't fought with. But um, she, still, she still very much mm-hmm. thinks of him affectionately. Yeah, I'll be so. there. You know, I was born when she was working at Hustler, and my birth was announced in Hustler magazine. (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, there was a little, like, blurb in the back of the magazine in Bits and Pieces, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was in the front. That's what it was called. Bits and Pieces, Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a picture of me, and I was nursing in a sling on her boob while she was shooting, and it was like, famed photographer Susan Randall gives birth to her first daughter, Holly. Oh, wow. And here I am all these years later. Who knew? Uh, Who would have guessed? Wow. I would have ended up in the porn industry. (laughs) Shocking. (laughs) Um, So actually, one of the girls that you repped, Ginger Lynn, told me um, a funny story about my mom and you. So she came in and I believe you had her booked with Stephen Hicks. That's probably true what you're going to say. Yeah. He was a good photographer. He was a great photographer. Yeah. Very talented. So you had her book with Stephen Hicks, and my mom came in, and she met Ginger, and she was like, and I think Stephen was was probably for Penthouse. I think that was usually the first, if a girl was really hot, that was the first magazine you'd pitch them to, right? That's correct. Yeah. And uh, my mom was like, oh, you know, I want to shoot this girl. And I think Ginger said, "Um, oh, well, you know, I'm supposed to be shooting with Stephen Hicks first. My mom was like, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. And she snatched her up and like booked her right away. I think she said something about he couldn't be my, my chauffeur <laughs> about Stephen Hicks. Yeah. She was, she so was funny. yeah. So one of the like guaranteed ways to get booked with my mom. And I'm sure you probably know this is to number one, tell her that you love and ride horses. Oh. Um, then she'll adore you. But number two is to say that you are on your way to see, or you've already got a tentative booking with either Stephen Hicks or Earl Miller. <laughs> and if that was the case, then my mom wanted you first. Cause she was so competitive. No, very, very competitive. And rightly so. Yeah. Rightly so. Yeah. It was competitive back then. Yeah. I mean, I guess it still is. Huh. Uh, what was Ginger Lynn like? A lot of drugs. Yeah. Uh, back then. Yeah. Uh, she was a good model. Mm-hmm. Was fair at acting. Mm-hmm. Just stay away from the drugs. Yeah. But she was quite popular. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was. Amber Lynn, Ginger Lynn. Ritzy Canyon, Tori Wells, there's a lot. Tracy Lords. Yeah, let's um, let's get into that story because that's a big one, and that was something that actually affected me as well um, because I was about seven years old when that whole scandal hit. So, can you tell us about who Tracy Lords was and what the specific scandal was? Because some people don't know. Tracy Lords was brought to me by a guy, something Rogers was his name. Mm. And this was back when I used to close at nine at night, Mm -hmm. so it was dark. Uh, He brought Tracy in and told me um, she wanted to get into the business. 
I sent her in the other room to get undressed. Uh, he said she'll end up doing porno. She knows who Ron Jeremy is, and she knows this, and she knows that. And I said, okay. I said, let me get some pictures of her. Got the pictures, was really impressed with her a lot. Saw her ID. She really had real ID. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how easy it was for a girl to get fake ID back then. Mm -hmm. All you'd have to do is walk into DMV, hand them your birth certificate with no picture, Mm -hmm. and tell them you need an ID made. They would make you an ID. That's that's a crucial detail that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. It's not like she was walking around with a fake ID that she got made in like right. downtown. Right. She went to the government office, mm-hmm. gave them a false birth certificate because which like you said had no picture to go with it. So of course, you couldn't verify for sure it was that person and she got a real ID. So when she came to people like you and everybody else who shot her um underage, because that's kind of what we're getting to. Turns out she was underage. Um, She had a real ID. So how on earth were you supposed to know that she was underage? Because from all accounts and purposes, from everybody I've spoken to, she was so far beyond her years, just looks wise, the way she behaved. You'd have never guessed in a million years ever that that she was underage. Yeah. And this, the worst, the dumbest thing I ever did when I let my Irish temper overcome everything else Mm -hmm. is the guy, the investigator from the federal people uh, said, why didn't you contact her high school? I said, you're an idiot. He said, what'd you say to me? I said, you're an idiot. I said, that's not even her name. (laughs) That girl that she got the ID from is of age. Had I called the school they both went to, right. they would have said she's of age. Right. Wasn't it her? I heard it was her cousins. No, the guy that came. said it was her stepfather was dating her mother. Right. But it's the, Roger's guy. But, but the fake birth certificate I got that she had that she used to get a fake ID, I heard it was her cousins, or am I making Oh, I, that I've never heard. Okay. That one I never heard. Who knows? But the guy was still an idiot. <laughs> yes, he <laughs> definitely was. Yeah. So how did you hear that she was underage? Uh, Seuss Randall. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> Seuss had called me or come by. I think she called me and said she's hearing rumors Tracy's underage. And I started laughing. How can a girl be underage that looks like this girl? Right. I mean, she looked 20. Yeah. And then you knew it was real when... They busted me. So you had a bunch of cops come in your office, right? I did. And they came in and said, you were highly recommended by Reb at Pretty Girl International. And this is your rival. we should come by. And they arrested me. So I remember that incident quite clearly, actually myself, because I was... I think somewhere I should get my dates right. I should find out exactly when the date of this was and then get my age right. Cause I, in my head, I was like seven, but I was probably more like 10. And I remember my parents sat me down because they thought they were going to go to jail, you know? And normally the mm-hmm. cops come when they often arrest you. If they're going to arrest you at home, they arrest you in the early morning hours right. when they know you're home and they like drag you out of bed. And it's very dramatic. And that's what they thought was going to happen to them. Mm. And since I was the oldest, they needed me to understand what might happen and what to do if that happened. So they sat me down and they were like, look, like the cops might come and take mommy and daddy away to jail. Mm. And if this happens, here are some phone numbers that you need to call and don't worry, it's going to be okay. Take care of your little brother. And I just remember thinking, why would my parents go to jail like you, and they you couldn't were seven or eight yeah i was i was wow. very young wow. and um and you know of course they couldn't tell me exactly what was going on right. i was too young to be explained the situation but i remember that very clearly cuz tracy was a good friend of my mom's actually mm. um she came to like my birthday party i remember there was a pair of i think angel wings that she gave me that like no, it was a ballerina costume that I wore all the time. Mm. And uh, my mom was close to her. And so that news affected them very much. And they 
you know, obviously were in a state of huge panic because they, my mom had shot more on Tracy than almost anyone. Mm -hmm. And so they took all their slides, all their chromes, because remember this is back before the internet, back before digital, and they piled them in the car and they drove around Los Angeles in a panic, throwing them into various dumpsters in the back of supermarkets, like underneath other trash. Similar to something I did. Yeah. To get rid of applications and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. To one trash can to another. Yeah. In fact, when I threw away all those 8 by 10s 11 by 14s and the other stuff, when I end up uh, having that together, that's exactly what I did to get try to get rid of some of it. Yeah. So does, your mom doesn't shoot anymore, does she? Mm-mm. No, she retired years ago. It was just too stressful for her. I ran into her about three years ago. I was sitting at a uh, gas station on Teo Boulevard, mm. and your mother had pulled from Joe's Tire across the street, mm-hmm. and we bumped into each other. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. About uh, four to five years ago, I guess. Yeah. And then, of course, we saw you at your 80th birthday. Yeah. Which wasn't yeah. that long ago. And yeah. she kept grabbing everybody's penis, just uh, like the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Oh, I gave up trying to control her after. So like, Rob married minutes. Christy Canyon, mm-hmm. I think. I I don't know who she's married to. To be uh, honest, yeah. He used to be a director. Okay. Well, he used to be a competitor of mine. Mm. He was the one that would get guys downstairs to get the girls' numbers. Yeah, you during was, casting you, calls. You would have these huge casting calls, right? Where like you had so many people that you actually ended up having to rent out a warehouse. Right. Was there ever like how picky were you about who you took on? Did you turn people down at all? Or I did you take a lot, everybody? Uh no, I didn't I turned very few people down. Really? Very few uh, you're gonna find there's room for everybody. Yeah. And some of the things that they shoot, mm-hmm. I don't even believe they're shooting. Mm. Like what? Well, just some of the kinky stuff that they do, um, some of the girls are not the best. Mm-hmm. But these guys don't have the budget for the best. Right. So they got to do what they got to do. Right. You were financing some movies yourself, correct? Right. But you never really ever went on set. No. Because? I learned a lesson. It was either Ginger Lynn or it was somebody else along those lines, but I went into Vogel's studio that everybody used to rent. Right. And when I went into to the, uh, to the studio, I couldn't see what the girl was doing, but I heard her say later, I, the guy just popped on my face, and Jim South walks in. <laughs> they were very, listen, when you get on them for doing drugs and you get on them for being non-punctual mm-hmm. and you get on them for, in some cases, gently, but hygiene, <laughs> you're going to, you're always, like a father and they don't, they don't want you on a set. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, now you brought up hygiene, <laughs> which is a conversation I have had to have with girls too oh. at times. And it's so awkward. So. How would you manage that? Because a lot of times, too, like as a producer, if you don't want to have to tell the girl, you'll call the agent and be like, look, you got to talk to your girl because the other performers are complaining that her vagina smells really bad. So how would you handle that? I would say that I had a pretty good way of approaching it. I would just say that uh, I know that you work a lot and you're going on interviews and it's hot outside. (laughs) And maybe even the car you drive is an air conditioned. And I said, this odor builds up with everybody. And then, you know, I try to give them the puppy look. <laughs> but it used to work. You got to be careful with that one, though. Yeah, especially as a man. It's a little easier for me as a woman. Oh, sure. To say it because I can like relate. I can be like, look, I understand. Yeah. Here are some tips and tricks that I use. Like, happens to all of us girls. But <laughs> as a man, like, I can understand that's, that's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Reb was pretty much the only other Asian in town. He was no Jim South, mm-hmm. no. but he had some girls. And he was, um, he 
was very competitive with you. He was. The first thing he said to me on the phone, the first time I ever talked to him, I've got about 80 pounds on you. And I said, what? He said, about 80 pounds. And I wanted to say, how tall are you? You want to go out? (laughs) 80 pounds. And what would he do to try to, like, disrupt your business? Would he make up stories to the girls? He was the greatest I've ever seen at causing trouble. He would get... This gentleman's a friend of his. Mm -hmm. He would get this guy to call up my girl that gives her number to everybody, Mm -hmm. and she's not supposed to, Mm -hmm. and just uh, tell him that he's in town for a short period of time. He's a business executive, and I said, Jim South told me uh, that I could take you out. Mm -hmm. And the girl said, what? Like as an escorting guest. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, said it again, and the girl quit me over it. Mm. So he's one, and it wasn't true, right? But she panicked. You never booked any escorting gigs. Mm. Did people approach you about it? Oh yeah. Did girls ask you if they if you could help them? Quite a few, and we used to talk about it going to the ranches mm. in Nevada. Oh right, like the bunny but, ranch. Boy, we lost that war. <laughs> well, there's a lot of them that work there. Yeah, now. yeah. It's actually um, more common now. Yeah. For sure. I and mean, girls are being more open about escorting. The guy that owns it, what's his name? Dennis Hoff? Yeah. He came in once, wanted to exchange girls, told him no. That was back when we felt, as you said earlier, there is a difference mm-hmm. in prostitution and being able to act and read a few lines mm-hmm. in it. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a difference. Um, but, you know, I'm of the opinion that it, whatever people want to do, it's fine as long as you're safe about it and you use protection, um, which I think a lot of girls are. So it's becoming more accepted now. Oh, yeah. Which is good. So, but back to Reb, because we're, we're not done with our story about Reb. Right. So Reb actually, I know you can't prove it, but you were attacked. Mm-hmm. And were you attacked like twice in one twice. week? Not in a week, but okay. twice. Okay. In fact, I had gone to dinner with Jethro Bodine, Beverly Hillbillies. Okay. You know Jethro? I think so. Yeah. I know the Beverly Hillbillies. I'm sure he's tried to contact you. He's a boob <laughs> freak. <laughs> uh, Who isn't, Jim? <laughs> anyway, we had gone to eat, and we went to, I think it was Solly's. No, it wasn't Solly's. And it was someplace in that area. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd gone to eat. Uh, Jethro pulled up in the parking lot at Solly's right across the street. Mm-hmm. And when he pulled up there, um, I got out of the car and he said, oh, no, this was the second attack. Well, I can still go ahead and tell you. And he said, Jim, check the back. Make sure there's nobody waiting for you. Mm-hmm. And he laughed. Mm-hmm. When I went to walk over to the aisle, my Van was parked in. He ended up, uh, I looked up and saw uh, what looked like a homeless guy pushing a carriage. Mm -hmm. And he was coming towards me. And I glanced down. And when I glanced down, I saw just a baseball bat in the carriage. Uh Uh-oh. Yep. So I turned to try to get my car door unlocked. And I uh, couldn't. Couldn't I dropped the keys? Yeah. When I dropped the keys, the guy swung on me. That made this this finger. That's as straight as I can get it. Oh wow! The baseball bat hit that, and like I said, this was the second attack though. That wasn't the first. The first attack broke both your arms. Uh, it actually. Which one was it? Oh wow! Yeah, I see that baseball bat. So only one arm. Hurt the other, but didn't break it. Okay. For some reason, I imagine you walking around with like two casts <laughs> on your arms. <laughs> Listen, that's not fun. You ought to try to use the restroom. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I can't believe I said that on the air. I forgot we were taping. <laughs> Duh. So, uh, so you were attacked twice. Right. But you were never, never able to prove it. No. Uh, even the cops said... They knew, well, 
the guy that did it had a trailer, like mm-hmm. a metal trailer, a little one, mm-hmm. and was living in Reb's backyard. Mm-hmm. He supposedly was offered $750, 750 bucks That's it. for doing it. He ended up collecting 400 and got screwed out of the rest. Was it cause, like, was he supposed to finish the job? Like, how badly was he supposed to hurt you? I don't know, but the, uh, the guy said a couple of times in the first attack, it was in my garage. Oh, he came to your house? Yeah, and he would, when he would swing it, he would hit a two before mm-hmm. that would slow it down, slow the bat down. Mm-hmm. The doctor said if it wasn't for that, I'd be dead. Wow. If I took a hit like that to my head, yeah, I'd be dead. Do you think that his intention was to have you killed? I think it was to scare me out of the business because nobody knows the real story on Reb and that agency. Hmm. I do. What is the real story? Can you tell The me? real story is, is that there was a guy that knew nothing about nothing in Hollywood. Uh-huh. And he had this little agency, and Reb used to be a finder. He would drive on his motorcycle and pick girls up and take them to the guy mm-hmm. if they were interested in doing it. And uh, finally, he got wise to it, said, I'm going to take it over. And he had his motorcycle buddies talk to the gentleman. Talk and to the, the guy, gentleman. Yeah, and the With guy. baseball bats, maybe? <laughs> and the guy moved out of state. Wow. And that's when Reb took over the agency. Now, what I've told you is alleged because mm-hmm. I can't prove any of it. Right. Wow. All right. Well, we are going to take one more commercial break, and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about your run-in with Larry Flint. Because that's well, you, quite a story as okay. well. Well, and you my, know, there's nothing that I can prove. Of course. We're not God, here to God prove anything. Say, we're just like to the Reb thing, cases. alleged. <laughs> I heard he passed away recently. Yeah. Reb. Yeah, I wouldn't know. Yeah. All right, guys, hang on. We'll be right back. Let's face it. We live in an entirely different world these days. And sometimes it's really hard to meet new people. Say hello to MyGirlFund.com. My Girl Fund allows you to form virtual relationships with sexy, fun women. On MyGirlFund.com, you can virtually meet, message, exchange photos and videos with girls in complete privacy. My Girl Fund was launched in 2009, and over the years, they've formed a community of amazing, fun, sexy women who want to meet you. My Girl Fund is completely discreet, and the girls on the website control their own exposure. These are not porn stars. These are regular girls who are looking to meet new people online and also maybe help get their college fund paid for. You can join MyGirlFund.com for free, and for a limited time, Get a lifetime membership for under $5 by visiting mygirlfund.com slash holly. Meet sexy, independent women and form intimate virtual relationships with them at mygirlfund.com slash holly. So uh, another run-in that you had was with the one and only Larry Flint. And can you tell us about that story? I had a, a, a verbal agreement with Flint, mm-hmm. which I did, mm-hmm. that he would get the girls first. Mm-hmm. Now, back then, this is 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. uh, like I told you earlier, a lot of girls did not want to be an hustler. Mm-hmm. So the ones that weren't, Seuss would get them, or Steve Hicks, or Fred Inky. I don't know if you know that name. Mm-mm. Very good photographer. Um they they kind of just took it over. But what Flint didn't want to understand is that some girls did not like that magazine. Yeah. Few, few, but there were quite a few. Uh, he called me, or he had his assistant, whoever it was, call me, said Larry wanted to sit down with me on a business meeting. Mm-hmm. And I said, listen, this was back when I did everything. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm backed up. I said, I can't really you know, walk out of the office. I don't think at the time I even had anybody else running it. I think I was doing it all. At any rate, the next day, Flint called me. And it was a big money deal on movies, and it was going to be this, going to be that. I was going to be the main guy, one thing and another. So I went. When I when I stepped into his Bel Air 
mansion. He just, um, there must have been about 20 people there. I know Clyde McLean was there. Um, almost everybody that shoots for him. I don't think Suits was there. No. I don't think so. No. At any rate, two of the bodyguards picked me up, kind of slammed me against the wall. When they went to frisk me, they were, rather than like this, they was more like this, shoving me back in the chair. Was that normal for people to get frisked around Larry? Probably since he was shot, I imagine. But even by... People who worked with him. I mean, you don't exactly have a history of I've being a stories. violent man. Who's I've heard like, stories of people being put on elevators that were fired and run out of the building. He had some bully boys as uh, protection, security, mm-hmm. right? Bully boys. At any rate, he started screaming at me in front of everybody about uh, he had my phone tapped, which he didn't. Mm-hmm. And it was this, and it was that, and it was going to be this thing and that thing, and I'm going to pay back all of the money that he paid me, one thing and another. Anyway, after he got through using me verbally and physically, um, he went the wrong way because I'm one of the. I'm like your mother. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me I can't do it. Right. That's just the way that it is. So he roughs you up in front of like all of these people. Yeah, he didn't actually beat me. Right. But it was kind of like over to search me. Right. To kind of go overboard with it. Right, 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 right. In front of all of his people screaming that he had the phone tapped and this and that. Right. And he he did try to take credit. Your mom's right. He tried to take credit on the beating or the what happened. Right. Yeah, because he, um, I believe he called my mother, from what I can recall from what my mother said, is that he called her up, I think, just a little bit after that, and invited her down to his place, like, at night, which I think is when you went Mm -hmm. there, right? Right, that's correct. Yeah. And so she sensed it was the same kind of situation. And um, and he was like, you know, why don't you come on down here, Suze? And she, having known what happened to you, just said, oh, that sounds great, Larry. If you beat me, then I'll just get a golden wheelchair and we can have races. <laughs> she said that to yes. him? Oh, my God. <laughs> so, you know, that's how she, you know, my mom, she tends to diffuse everything with humor. But, uh, yeah, she, her and her head um, – I think, you know, as legends do, they grow and become bigger. She oh, yeah. thought that you got pistol whipped by his bodyguards. Oh, no. But I think that that's No, just... what did happen is that uh, I had a van, and it was a real high step to get in it. Mm-hmm. And the bodyguard, both of them, kind of picked me up, and they said, if we hear that you told anybody about what happened here, you're dead. And they had a gun to my head. Mm. That's probably where she got the. That's where she got it from. But they didn't. They didn't actually pistol whip you. No, they didn't. But they put a gun to your head and threatened you. That's. And when I got up in the van, I had one leg out. One of them slammed the door. I thought he'd broken my leg, but he didn't. You've been through a lot. I have. (laughs) I have. So I want to ask you also, too, about um, some people that you worked with a lot. Uh, Ron Jeremy is somebody that you knew really well. And Um, I know you've heard the stories. He's kind of been Me Too'd. Um, I've told him over and over and over mm -hmm. about his very persistent at getting a date with a girl. Right. And I said, Ronnie, you come in my office you're wearing filthy jeans. I tell him, mm-hmm. filthy jeans. I said, you. I said you need a haircut. You need. I knew him well enough to say that mm-hmm. you need to go bathe mm-hmm. and take care of yourself. And I used to tell him, I said, Ronnie, you can't, you stay after them until they'll say anything to get you off the phone. <laughs> and I said, you've got to stop. Yeah, it can't work that way. Right. And he he was complaining once that the girl stood him up. And I said, Ronnie, 
I was here when you were on my phone, and you would not take no for an answer. What do you expect the girl to say? Yeah. Yeah. So you go into your office and use your phone and call girls? Oh, sure. Yeah. Listen, you'd be surprised a number of girls that will make it with him because he is a star. Right. He's he's, uh, Male-wise, I think he's the most popular ever. Yeah. What do you think made him so popular? Well, look at how long he's been in it. You know what the first picture of me, he showed me of himself? What? An 8 by 10 of him giving himself head. Oh, right. He was famous for that. So, you know, Ginger Lynn has a really funny story about Ron Jeremy. She said her first, one of her first scenes, she did two in one day. And one of the scenes, the second one was with Ron Jeremy. And this is when in his good looking days. Right. And she thought he was so unattractive that she would only do doggy style with him so she didn't have to look at him. (laughs) Terrible. That's tough. That's tough. Oh my God. Speaking of unkept men, I was told that I need to ask you about the homeless guy that came into your agency no. who wanted to be a star, and what happened with that? <laughs> this guy keeps coming in wanting me to get him work, and he just, he was really an ugly guy <laughs> and, and kind of strange. And Marco had mentioned. Was he actually homeless? No, oh, yeah. So, okay, so could anyone just That's, walk into your office? Well, yeah, they can walk in. Doesn't mean I'm going to get them work. Right. But they could walk in, sure. But, I mean, I would think that, like, once people figured out that you had famous porn stars there all the time, like, didn't you have random people walking in all the time that you would have to shoo out? I wouldn't put it quite that way. I had people that wanted work, that needed work, or a lot of these girls might be on the street if it wasn't for the industry. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, if you don't know the industry, everybody looks at it to the reverse Mm -hmm. of what I just said. Yeah. We're all animals and one thing and another. Right. Okay. So this homeless guy comes in, wants work. Wants work. And he, almost every day, wasn't it, Marco? Just about every day. Once a week. Yeah. He would come in, but and and he hit it on nail on the head. I finally told the guy. I said, "I can't get your work." I said, "You're filthy. Clean up." And he, I don't know where he went. Might have went to the Y Y W C A or Y M C A, and came back. And <laughs> that's when we sent him to Derek. So wait, he came back all cleaned up, and according to Marco, he was wearing an ascot. <laughs> where did he get that from? <laughs> so he's all dressed up. He's had a haircut. He's had a bathe. He's wearing what, like some kind of suit? I forgot what he was wearing. Yeah. Slacks. yeah. Shirt, yeah. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. You know, it's funny because they have these outreach programs for homeless people where they can get like nice clothes mm-hmm. to wear to go on business interviews to jumpstart a career. But I feel like few people thought that they were going into interview to be a porn star. <laughs> oh, so, okay. So you send him to Derek. You send him to Ali Direct. And Derek said, did you send some guy over here that was homeless? <laughs> I said, you know what? I had a bunch of people in here, and he was asking everybody how to get work. Somebody must have, must have mentioned your name. <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine Derek calling to you like, Jim, did you send a homeless man over here? <laughs> oh, my God. That's so good. Well, Jim, thank you so much. This has been really incredible. Um, Is there anything that you want people to know about you? Well, I want them to know that we thought we were retiring. Mm -hmm. This is several years ago. And uh, we ended up not retiring. Mm -hmm. But it's still running on some website that we are retired and we're not. Okay. We're still booking girls. And this is World Modeling. Yeah, World okay. Modeling. Worldmodeling.com. Right. Which you is on the internet, which is usually fueled by Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> I know her real well. <laughs> I came here and I asked Jim for the Wi-Fi code. And Jim looks at me, he's like, what's Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> Marco, it's okay. Like Marco's I said, I'm afraid I, to laugh. Yeah, it's okay. I connected via my hotspot on my phone. It's fine. That's funny. 
<laughs> I would ask people where they could follow you on social media, but I feel like you're probably not on social media. I know. I don't think I am either. Yeah. No Twitter, Instagram. No. No, that's where you're failing, Jim. Mm-hmm. You need to get on social media. You need to get yourself like a Twitter handle. Yeah. Yeah. You think? Yeah. <sighs> Big deep sigh. I feel like this is not going to happen. <laughs> no, I don't really should. I'm going to be your manager, Jim. We're going to no. bring world modeling back. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, is Christy Canyon still doing Playboy? Uh, She has a vivid radio show. Ah. Uh. But Playboy itself is also completely changed. Like Playboy Radio is no more. Um, Playboy TV is kind of revamping. They've undergone so many changes in the mm. last few years. So um, yeah, I don't. She is no longer at Playboy Radio, but she does have a, a vivid radio show on Sirius mm. XM. So Christy's doing great. I liked her. Yeah, I think everybody loves. Even Christy. though she stood up her own shooting at her house. You want to tell that story really quickly before we close out? I thought we did earlier. Yes, but that was when we were before we were recording, Jim. Oh. You got to tell the world the story. Somebody was booking Christy Canyon, who has been and is still one of my favorites. Uh, she gives a great scene and she's a pretty good actress herself. But the, but she had a reputation at one time about not being the most reliable. One of the guys said, what if she doesn't show? I said, doesn't show. You're shooting her at her house. How can she not show? And she didn't show. <laughs> and I look like an idiot. <laughs> uh, what your, do you think? Your mother shot her, didn't she? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. My mom shot Christy a bunch. Um, what do you think is one of the hardest things about being a porn agent? You got to understand that it's strictly a job. Mm. Again, I'm not an angel. Nobody is. But you don't want to step over that line. You want to book them, be serious so they can't come back with you. Because I've had complaints on me. Mm -hmm. Any agent, even a regular agent, Mm -hmm. you're not going to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. Right. You don't want to give them applications. Right. Uh, That's one reason Ronnie, I'm told, got barred from the convention. Mm-hmm. I think that's true. Um, yeah, he just he had a lot of stories come out against him about um, groping people inappropriately and you know sexually harassing girls, sexually assaulting girls. I mean, there's 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 a lot of stories. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you think they will unbar him? That's a great question. I do think that the porn industry is very good at forgetting people's indiscretions. Mm-hmm. Um, the public in general. So maybe, um, but you know, also too, like there's still a lot, the cancel culture is very strong right now and Ron's been canceled. Mm. So, um, it'll be interesting to see if he and many other people will come back from that. I've known him a long time and he just didn't sound right. Mm. I think it's a medication. Yeah. Well, from, he, from his heart attack. Ever since the heart attack, he's he's not been doing that great. So. Yeah. He's, even he slurs most of his speech. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. Um. So, I guess that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much, Jim. This has My been pleasure, really Ron. entertaining. I'm so glad that we could make this happen. I know I've been kind of chasing you down for a little while. Oh, no, that's fine. I just... Don't give many interviews these days. I know you don't, which is why I so appreciate you giving me your time. Yeah, no problem. All right, guys. So go check out Jim at worldmodeling.com. He's still running his agency. He is he is a good man. He's one of the few honest people in this industry. And maybe he'll have social media one day. We'll see <laughs> if he can figure out how to get his Wi-Fi to work. <laughs> But until then, you can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. My Facebook page is facebook.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. My Patreon is patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next week. <laughs>